right. No matter what type of business you're in, or really no matter what type of business you think you're in, ultimately we're all in the communication business. Um, all of us. Whether you're in the communications business because that's what you do from a, if you're a PR writer, TV, radio, or if you're an entrepreneur like me or a doctor or a lawyer or a professor, we're all in the communications business. Today I want to talk about uh, what is the oldest communication technology, and that is conversation. Uh, conversation, again, has been around since the dawn of man. Um, even before there were smoke signals, men and women were, were conversing. Um, but something happened. Uh, fast forward in history, about 1450, this thing called the printing press uh, arrived on the scene, uh, which obviously perfected the written word. And then you had radio, then you had TV. And for 500 years, it was a significant thing happened. Conversation all of a sudden took a back seat. And all of a sudden, where we were having two-way communication, talking and conversing in front of each other, all of a sudden we had these new technologies, which were awesome in themselves, but they were very much pushing. But then something very dramatic happened. I'm going to multitask. Just when things over, it keeps going. All right, we're dialed up. Um, and with the internet, you know, came a lot of, lots of stuff. And we had uh, Jim Barksdale in this audience as a sponsor, built an incredible company called Netscape, which led us browse. There was chat. There was all this information. Um, and soon after, you know, we all received hundreds of CD-ROMs in our mailboxes. They would give us 160 hours for X dollars per month. But all of that, obviously, something happened. Soon after all this stuff was happening, all of a sudden, after 500 years, conversation once again was the hottest commodity and it got back into the limelight so that's what we're going to talk about today when you think about chat and and all the things that happen with the browsers and and the data the you've got mail all of this you know quickly changed what was in the digital realm and there was lots of stuff so we quickly moved ourselves into what we call the search age and in the search age things got a little bit organized it was about to be chaotic and all of a sudden great companies like Lycos, Alta Vista, so forth, eventually Yahoo and obviously the big one, uh, Google did some pretty impressive things, very impressive things. They organized all of this stuff so we could search for it. But again, we were looking for it, right? And so what you were looking for, you could find, but you were looking for it. So obviously on the hills of the search age, no one would have ever dreamed we'd have this thing called the search age. And the search age hit us and it was just, and it's here today, and it's, it's, it's beyond uh, uh, comprehension what, what people can comprehend where it's going to go. It's massive. I do a lot in social media. Uh, I just got back from China several months ago where I speak on Chinese social media, which is crazy big. And, and you know, if you look at just Twitter, Twitter, there's a billion tweets every two days. A billion tweets every two days. So all of a sudden, we have lots and lots of information out there. Um, and, I, of course, we all in this audience um, use these. But what happened is... We now are in what I call uh, the find age. And the find age is an age that we cannot, none of us, whether we're a nonprofit, a for profit, a church, a faith based organization, we cannot afford to wait to be found anymore. It's impossible. There's too much stuff. A lot of it's good, a lot of it's bad. But in the digital space, it's no longer an option, no matter what your entity is, to wait to be found or wait for people to look for you. It's just not going to work. The world's moving too fast. So, what I call the find age is an age when you have to go find. And so if you just look at a normal consumer journey at the top, the consumers don't know who you are. At the bottom, they know who you are and they buy your product and you, and you convert them. Well, that's great. And, and we think of search, all the search engines, that's great when people are looking for you. But what about all the people who aren't yet looking for you? What about all the people at the top of the funnel? And every person in, in humanity has to go through the top of the funnel before they go to the bottom of the funnel. And so the challenge becomes for businesses, organizations, nonprofits, you name it, is how do we go find those people not yet looking for us? And so we believe the answer is find their conversations. You know, if you, if you grew up in Colorado, you're expected to know how to ski. If you grew up in, <coughs> excuse me, uh, California, you're expected to know how to surf. But you grew up in Mississippi, you're expected to know how to tell a story and carry on a conversation. 
I grew up in the Mississippi Delta, which I'm very thankful for. I've traveled the world, I've lived overseas. I'm back here again building a company I'm excited about. But I got that gift of conversation growing up in Greenville, Mississippi. And I got it because, you know, that was our form of entertainment. Conversation was the entertainment. We didn't have a lot of stuff. And so I conversed. I, you know, I learned how to converse with my parents. More, more, you know, more importantly, people older than me, their friends. And I learned that gift of conversation, which I'm very thankful for. And, and as I reflect in my 45 years of life so far, that has carried on my entire career so far. I used that gift of conversation after leaving college to go to Dallas, Texas, to work in that tall green building. Uh, and I used the gift of conversation to help me put myself in the right conversations to go up the little corporate ladder. I quickly used that gift of conversation very much so to get myself in a situation that led me to live in Budapest, Hungary, you know, when I was 22 and an exciting time when democracy was coming in and communism was coming out. But it was that gift of conversation that I used to help, you know, that gift of conversation from Mississippi that I used to help uh, privatized industries. And, and then lastly, or next, I used that gift of conversation coming back to Dallas in the late 90s. Uh, I built an internet company to sell CDs online when Amazon was only selling books. But the, what I did was use chat rooms where people were con conversing, and I used the gift of conversation to find those people not looking for us. And then lastly, I'm back here in the great state of Mississippi again, which I'm so excited to be, and I'm building a company around conversation. Um, so it's so fun to do that every day for businesses. So when we talk about the find age, you know, you have to find the conversation. And what I'm going to get into real quickly is talk about intersections. It's all about intersections when we think of finding people not looking for you. So what do I mean? When we look at intersections, when we look at just us as humans, we all have passions. We all have interests. We all have, uh, we all obviously are a different age group. We're a millennial. We're an X generation. We're a, a baby boomer. We all love certain activities. We might want to bike. We might want to swim or divorce, we're single, we love to date. All of these things are intersections that you, as a business organization, can use to find those not looking for you. And they sit right in between your product and your company, as, as opposed to someone looking for you already. And so I think it's very important when you think of your business, your nonprofit, what are the conversations that you wanna have and you wanna be at, because you wanna be at that cocktail party when someone talks about a service you offer, well, these are the cocktail parties, and we're going to talk about conversation in that regard. I want to do a quick uh, audience survey. I'm going to ask four questions. First, who in here, and I can barely see, who in here uh, would love to see James Taylor in concert? Looks like almost everybody. Uh, who in here would love to have a pool in their backyard? Everybody remember the answers, okay? Uh, and who in here would love to have a Harley Davidson? Maybe half. All right. And lastly, who in here wants a colonoscopy? <laughs> I, I, I don't see anybody. Okay, remember those answers. Now, I'm sure in this audience, somewhere in this audience, there is someone who owns a vacation home. Okay, so let's just assume someone in here owns a home in Aspen, Colorado, uh, and it's a four-bedroom home, ski in, ski out. Okay, I'm sure someone in here is representative of the banking industry, and I'm sure someone in here is representing, uh, obviously, the healthcare industry, whether you're a clinic, hospital, or doctor. Well, in the search age, if you're, you own that Aspen vacation rental property, and if on your website you put that you have a four-bedroom home and it has ski and ski access and all the amenities about it, and someone goes and searches for that, guess what? They're going to find you, but they're looking for you, okay? If you're a banker and for whatever reason someone is actually searching for a home equity line and you on your website put the fact that you have a home equity line uh, special with a low interest rate, and someone searches on that exactly, guess what, they're gonna find you. And lastly, if you're a medical uh, uh, healthcare organization and you do screen for colon cancer uh, and someone is looking for that, then they're gonna find you. But let's talk about the pre-customer. We talked about pre-customers earlier. This is Henry. Henry is 50 years old. And three things about Henry. Henry is not looking to go to Aspen for vacation. Henry is not looking for a home equity line, and Henry certainly isn't looking for a colonoscopy, uh, although he should, he's 50. All right, um, but when we think about the pre-customer, first, we think about intersections, and I wanna show you how Henry can be found, because even though he's not looking for you, okay? First is, Henry loves James Taylor, all right? He's 50 years old, he, for his 25th anniversary, he wants to take his bride to go see James Taylor, right? 25 years ago, they listened to James Taylor when they were dating. He would love to go see James Taylor. 
But guess what? He's not looking for an Aspen vacation rental. Well, why does this matter? Well, because James Taylor is playing in Aspen with Jerry Jeff Walker. Uh, so what does it matter? What can you do if you're that Aspen vacation rental property owner? You can go tweet and use conversation, Facebook, etc. because I promise you Henry and his wife are on Facebook and Twitter, and they do talk about James Taylor. So what you can do is go tweet, what, what's your favorite James Taylor song? Stay in this beautiful home and see him sing fire and rain, live in this, you know, come to this vacation rental. That you're going to find him by thinking about James Taylor. Next thing is, uh, Henry is not looking for a home equity line, but Henry just got a little bonus at work, needs a little extra money, but he wants to put a pool in his backyard, and he can't afford it totally without some kind of financing, but he's not looking for financing. He's dreaming about that pool. He and his wife want to put the grandbabies in that pool. He wants a pool in his backyard. Well, why does this matter? Well, he needs a home equity line to build a pool, okay? Or it could be a man cave. It could be anything that he's trying to do. So why does that matter? That's how you find the pre-customer if you're a bank. You have to go talk about the lifestyles of those people that do the things that lead them to a home equity line. So in this case, you can message if you're a bank, parties, cookouts, memories, imagine the family fun you can have around your swimming pool. Let us make your dreams come true. Link to bank.com. All right, and lastly, Henry is not looking for a colonoscopy at all, um, uh, although he should be. Uh, but Henry Lutz really, really wants to have a Harley Davidson. He's 50 years old, he's hit midlife crisis, and he t he's talking about a Harley Davidson. Well, that's the intersection to find Henry if you're a medical clinic. So, again, in all these cases, there's a lot more people looking for James Taylor, the pool, and the Harley Davidson than are looking for a bank or a rental, et cetera, et cetera. So in the case of the Harley Davidson, a little humor here, turning 50, you deserve to celebrate the milestone with the Harley Davidson, but seriously, don't forget to get a colonoscopy. <laughs> <clears throat> so in this case, you can actually tweet that if you're a hospital because you do want people to come in and get screened for colon cancer, and that's fun, and that's what people want to see. Um, oops. So, you know, in these cases, we talk about Lots about the pre-customer. I want to give two really good homegrown examples. One is Mississippi College, where I went to school. Mississippi College, to find the pre-customer, is talking about what makes it special. Well, guess what? It has an unbelievable equestrian program, okay? That is the intersection for them to find young lady, true story, young girls in California who are never going to search for Mississippi. They might even think we wear shoes, but they're not looking for Mississippi, but they do love horseback riding. So if we go tweet can't imagine not riding a horse every day. You can ride every day after class at Mississippi College. That's going to find the young lady in California who's never going to search for you, okay? That's their pre-customer. Pre Last example for a homegrown is my, one of my favorite companies in the world and obviously built by another great Mississippian, Fred Carl, is Viking. Viking, Fred Carl, had no even choice to find people or to go after people already looking for him because he built a category. And there, there was no commercial range in the kitchen, right? Besides his wife, no one else was looking for one. Okay, so what happened was he built his entire brand on thinking about the pre-customer, right? The person who loved the culinary lifestyle, who loved to cook or aspired to cook, right? Um, and design. And so, you know, if he goes and talks about cooking and fried chicken, guess what? He'll find people who need a Viking range. That is much different than saying, come by my Viking range because it has X number of BTUs. That's not what people are looking for. So, like it or not, People are talking. We talked about that earlier in some of the presentations about the internet. Conversation is going on every single day in massive amounts. I want to do a couple stats just to throw out there. We all know these are important, but these are serious, serious stats to show how many pre-customers are talking every day that you can find. 1.2 billion people on Facebook. That's significant. That's obviously a big fraction of the world. 47% of Americans say that Facebook is the number one influencer of purchasing decisions. That's 47%. I'd have you all ask yourself, do you spend 47% of your time or your marketing dollars on Facebook? That's a fact. Twitter, my favorite platform in the world, the most misunderstood platform, and by the way, for the record, it is not a social network, it is a publishing network. And Twitter has 550 million active users. 34% of marketers say they use it to find, to go after customers. But here's the staggering fact. Since 2012, the age group of 55 to 64 year olds, that's Henry, okay, has grown by 79%. That is your pre customer. 
And lastly, we cannot talk about stats without talking about mobile. Mobile is, is almost scary. 91% of the time spent on that mobile device that I have over there, on average, is spent on social media. 91% of the time spent on a mobile device, think about it, is spent having conversations. Those are your pre-customers. Those are the people you need to find. That means 9% of the time they're actually talking on the telephone, right? And then the scariest stat is 25% of mobile users cannot remember the last time their phone was out of earsight, earshot. Excuse me. That's significant. That's scary, right? And another statistic that's sort of odd but has a huge ramifications is the fact that in 1996, 85% of high school seniors had a driver's license, okay? In, in 2012, that reduced to 73%. I saw, saw the other day that's now below 70%. Why is that? Okay, why does that matter? Well, that matters because, well, one, less people drive, less people go by billboards, but more importantly, think about it. That's, people see freedom as the phone. People see, so I grew up in the, eight, I, I drove in the 80s. I used the car keys to actually drive across town to talk to somebody, or better yet, I might talk to them in the car. But now, kids use the phone to talk to people, right, and have conversations. These kinds of things you have to think about because they're significant uh, for impacting the pre-customer. Um, real quickly, uh, you know, the front porch, we talked about Mississippi. I love the front porch. It's, I have a front porch. But today I charge you that your front porch, the front porch, is in the palm of every pre-customer's hand. That's where the front porch is. And you have a choice to go into those conversations or not. You know, I get excited about growing up in Mississippi. I have a great company. I've built around conversation here. I have great partners. I have a great staff, great creative people. I have great technologists. Um, uh, but a lot of people think it's odd that I built, I'm building a conversation company in Mississippi. And I just real quickly, last fall, I was at the Stanford, Oregon football game in Palo Alto where I spend time. And this woman came up to me under a beautiful redwood tree and said, why on earth would you have a conversation, a cutting edge conversation company in Mississippi. I looked at her and said, why wouldn't I? Um, and I said, you know, do you, do you know who William Faulkner is? And I, and I went in and she obviously looked, up, looked at me like I was crazy, but I'm proud to be here in Mississippi. Um, in, in closing, you know, I am a recovering CPA. Uh, I, I did pass the test 25 years ago and I understand finance very well. I understand balance sheets. I understand numbers. I understand spreadsheets. And I will tell you, my 45 years so far with the finance background and now a passionate marketer, that there is no other better asset in the world that you can have as a nonprofit, for profit, no matter what you do, your biggest asset is the conversation. Okay? And think about it if you own the conversation that your pre customers are having, you will have mind share, you will have market share, and you will grow. In, in closing, Lastly, I don't care if you're in Mississippi, LA, Shanghai, New York, Boston, anywhere. Your conversation is the most fertile ground you have. And so I hope today I've been able to help you understand how you can go harvest yours. Thank you.